Now today I want to start off with the book of Colossians. And we're going to start in chapter 1, starting at verse 13. Now, the interesting thing um, about Colossians, this is a church that got started. Now, I'm speaking from historians. Of course, I wasn't there. But uh, they say a church got started in Colossae because it was close to Ephesus, where Paul had spent a lot of time. So that word must have spread to Colossae, and a small church got started there. Now, when Paul wrote Colossians, he was actually believed to be in Rome in house arrest, about 60 to 62 A.D., So the pastor from this church in Colossae came to him and told him about the church, but told him that there's a concern he had because there's some Gnostic belief coming into the church. Now, if you're not sure what Gnostic belief is, it's kind of the idea that God created the the earth and the universe, and he just kind of gave the earth a spin, and now he's on to other things. And that Jesus Christ isn't really God, he's just a higher form of being And he visited us and gave us some good information. Even some of it believes that he was possessed by a higher being. You know, when John the Baptist baptized him, he came up, that some higher being actually possessed him and told us all these things. And then when he's crucified, he went off and he's doing his thing. So imagine the kind of letter you would have to write to correct this. You know, you're in house arrest. I'm sure he wants to get there and speak to him himself. So he's got to write this letter. So he writes this letter and he starts out, you know, he's, he's saying, I'm so excited, I've heard about you, that you're new in Christ, and I pray for you to get wisdom and spiritual understanding of who you are now. And then he's going to say what I'm about to read, and right after this, what I'm going to say, right in between this, he talks about how Jesus Christ really is Lord, and that Jesus Christ himself actually created the earth and everything. So this is kind of going against the Gnostic belief that God just gave it a spin and took off and Jesus is just another higher form. And they believe the way you ascended was to find out secret knowledge. So you find out secret knowledge in the spirit, finding out how to ascend and become like God. Well, that doesn't sound like the scripture, does it? Now, in the middle of this, Paul's going to say something to kind of get them straight. And starting at verse 13, in Colossians 1.13, it says, For he has rescued us, from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgiveness of sins. Notice the past tense has. See, these people are looking to find a way to ascend to a higher level and he's saying, wait a minute, when you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, this is something that happened to you when you got saved. You got rescued from the kingdom of darkness. And translated, or I, I like what uh, King James says, says transferred. You've been, or, or this says transferred. King James says translated, kind of like beam me up, Scotty. All of a sudden, he's snatched from the devil and placed into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now, guess what that word is? That kingdom word is basilia. That's not mean, that didn't mean he get translated to heaven. Did you notice when you got born again, you're not in heaven? This isn't heaven, is it? No. <laughs> no, it's not in heaven. So this could be confusing. If I've been transferred from that kingdom of the devil and I didn't get transferred to heaven, why does it seem like there's all kind of devil around still? We're going to look at this and Paul's going to address this in saying how you need to focus your life. Now, if he said that to the Colossian church, would that be true today? Should we be thinking about that we've been taken from the devil's hold into a whole new place? Now, if you go to another country, you know how, what's kind of sad is people complain about America. seems to be the end thing. But if you visit other countries, they don't have it as good as we do. And if you try to engage in some of the freedoms that you had going into another country, you could get in big trouble. So that if you get transferred to something else, there's a whole set of different rules there. Well, it's the same with the kingdom of God. What the devil has going on is one thing, but Jesus Christ has something totally different going on. So he's getting their mind saying, you don't have to become something, you actually are something when you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now we have to get our mind around about it, about this uh, kingdom of God. Now if you notice, I'm still on the subject of the kingdom of God, and I'm not running out of material. John the Baptist warned about it, saying, hey, the kingdom's getting ready. Get yourself ready to hear about this kingdom. Jesus comes and says, 
okay, this is what the kingdom looks like and pray for it. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. That kingdom comes when you get born again. It's not when you get to heaven. His authority is getting in all the earth when you say yes to Jesus Christ. That means every place that you are, that's kingdom. The kingdom of God. And we've been moved into that. So if we've been moved into that kingdom, shouldn't we know about that kingdom? The 12 preached about it. The 70 preached about it. Paul's preaching about it. So should we know about this? If he's telling this church, hey guys, you've gotten off, you need to be thinking about this kingdom. So I'm still on that subject. <laughs> you can't hear too much about the kingdom. But I didn't get to, last time I didn't get to finish, so I, I, I need to review just a little bit first. To, a good way to show the difference between this kingdom is John 10.10. 10. The thief has not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. You know, that's something, that's the only reason he comes. The only reason. So he doesn't really have a good idea, does he? What if Adam and Eve didn't listen to him and knew that he was a liar? How about things, look how much their life changed for not understanding what they were and the place they were in. But Jesus didn't stop there. Here's the, here's the other side. We've been translated from that into this. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. That life is Zoe. That's a full life. Life right with God, peace, all the fruit of the Spirit. That's what that part is, away from the evil into this life. And he said he wanted to have abundantly. That word abundantly means more than necessary. So we got life inside of us that's more than necessary. But have you sometimes felt like I needed life? There's something death in my, in, in my life going on. How do I get those things connected? Because life is inside of me, but my trouble's out here. What do I do to connect those things so that I'm representing this new kingdom that I'm a part of because otherwise yeah I get born again and I'm going to go to heaven but God needs to do things here because he wants us to have this mentality yes you're going to go to heaven but right now I need to get this kingdom on the earth you guys need to operate in this kingdom that's why we need to know it if if we're to spread this gospel then we got to understand this kingdom and how it works because that's our job to do I mean, when we pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. That kingdom come is us. I like what Marcy said in one of her class. We're what he's got to work with. You know, so it's really kind of on us, and it could be so easy to go from generation to generation and things get lost. You know, people could know about things like I've mentioned before, baptism in the Holy Spirit. People got so off that they thought that was the devil and actually threatened people's lives when that first started happening in Azusa Street and stuff. And that's something that had been lost. It popped up here and there, but for the most part, it had been lost for almost a couple thousand years. And we know the importance of that. That's, that's, that's your leading. That's the Holy Spirit reminding you about that Zoe life, that every word that comes out of Jesus' mouth is life. So we need to know that. We need to tie into that. Along with that, John 6, 63 says, this is Jesus speaking, it is the Spirit who gives life and the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life, or the word zoe. So every word he's speaking is this life. So if we want life in us, we need to hear what he's saying on the subject, don't we? Yeah. We need to know that, because otherwise, if you're not getting life, what are you getting? And all, like I said, all you got to do is turn on the TV and you get a bunch of that. Now, I'm not against TV, but I'm against some of the stuff they say. And, and if you look, it gets worse and worse. You know, some of the things they're doing on TV now, when I was a kid, they never could have done that. You know, they, they would have pulled them off the air for doing that kind of stuff. Now it's like they're going to pull you off the air if you don't say that stuff. I mean, it, it's almost, <laughs> I can't believe how fast it's gone. If you're younger, you don't realize, but some of the stuff you see would have been rated R and stuff. It's like, and this is on TV. I kind of feel bad for younger people now, but growing into that, they just think that's how the world is. So all the more, we've got to know about this life. We, we've got to tell the world because otherwise, if we don't do our job, we're going to have to wait for the next generation. And it's just going to get harder for them and harder for them. Also, John 12, 49, this is Jesus saying again, for I, have, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. 
So actually, this Zoe life is from the Father. Jesus Christ is just repeating what the Father says. In yourself, do you, do you think you say everything the Father says only? Well, we got a ways to go then, don't we? Not to get up ourselves, but I can't say everything I do is God-led. You know, there's some things that God's in charge of and other things he gave us responsibility for. Like yesterday, I was working, and afterwards, my sister always feeds us. And at the end, she had this apple pie with ice cream. Yeah, God's in control, but he didn't make me eat that. That was my idea. I had that pie and ice cream because it tasted good. And not because God made me do it. I'm not against pie and ice cream, but, you know, that's not the time you should be on a diet, I guess. But there's some things that are in our control. And we weigh in our minds, well, what way are we going to do? You ever see the cartoons where there's a devil on one side of the shoulder and an angel on the other or God's on the other? Well, that's kind of us. I've kind of wondered this too and prayed about it. God, why are you letting this continue like this? I'm born again and you're inside. You're inside of me. I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit, but my flesh is always at war wanting to do the wrong thing. And really, this is kind of the proving ground. God took his heart, his very heart, and placed it inside of ours. And then put his Holy Spirit, I mean, that's his Holy Spirit came inside of us, and then Jesus dwells in that. So now you've got a choice. Are you going to follow me and do what I say just because I'm forcing you to do it? You've got this flesh on one side telling you one thing. I'm in here changing your heart to do another. Now, which are you going to choose? Because if God just wanted to save everybody, all he has to do is dangle you over hell and you'll make your decision, won't you? If you got any brains, just to save yourself. Well, you know, Satan had that in heaven at some point. He wasn't always bad right from the beginning. At some point, he became Satan. And the knowledge of good and evil, he tried that out. Well, God's not going to let that happen again in heaven. Our knowledge of that's going to be here. We're going to figure this thing out here. Are we going to listen to God or are we going to listen to the devil? And we see the contrast. I mean, which do you want? Kill, uh, steal, kill, and destroy, or do you want life and abundantly? And if, you know, if we don't, if we get that screwed up, it's kind of our fault once we're born again because he's given it to us. And this, and this is really a test in life, is which are you going to choose? On one side, you got my heart. On the other side, you got the flesh. Which is it you're going to do? Are you going to crucify that flesh? Or are you just and follow me or are you just going to let your flesh go and you're going to treat Jesus Christ as your fire insurance well if you really, I mean thank God he's my fire insurance but this thing about the kingdom of God is it just to be used for our self fulfillment this isn't used just to heal my body bless my bank account I, I know in myself I had this happen I never really had problem with finances from I mean, from the time I started in work. And I did pretty good, and I was making good wages, and pretty soon wages get better and better. So I think I've got a handle on finances and trust in Him. But it's so easy to get caught up to where you're trusting in finances and not Him. And as soon as something started happening to finances, all of a sudden, shocker, is like, whoa, I didn't know as much about this as I thought because now I'm in fear. I found out I was really just after God to get money, and that was my God. I'm using God to, to get my God. I kind of trust you, Lord, but I really trust the money. I trust you, Lord, but I'd rather just be healthy, which is good. It's good to have money. It's good to be healthy, but everybody's going to come into something. Everybody's going to have a challenge in their body, in their finances, in their relationships. Yeah, we need in ourselves, I mean, I think everybody in here is dealing with something. You know what I mean? So, we all need help at something, personally. So it's good that we selfishly need it, but we aren't just concerned about ourselves. There's a whole bunch of people out there in reality that is not going to have it as good as us. Even though Jesus Christ died for the whole world, there's a whole world out there that's not going to make it, even though it's a free gift. You know, I think about it, it's really kind of sad. It's not like they're going to go to hell for the sin they committed because the price has been paid. It's for rejecting a free gift. 
That's like if I'm going to Thanksgiving, my mother's cooking a meal, I go away hungry because I think I'm not worthy or I'm not interested when the meal is there. She's not going to pop it in my mouth, but she made it available. I shouldn't go away hungry. And how much more serious is salvation? People, will, there is a hell to go to. And we don't want them to go there. We shouldn't be so self-concerned about ourselves that I just want me, mine, and feel good and forget about the world. So when I'm reading this about the kingdom, yes, we need to learn in ourselves that God loves us and wants to take care of us. But we need to, with that knowledge and with that confidence, we need to tell others. We need to be a blessing and a billboard. So us having money isn't a bad thing. Us having our finances and our health. I mean, if you're looking at two people and you decide which door to go through, do I want to go where there's a good meal going on and they're healthy and fun, or do you want to go to the place over here that's miserable and the people are trying to kill, steal, and destroy from you? You know, we need to be that good people they want to look to and go, I want to be like that. Even though crazy things happen, they have a handle on life. Something's going on and want to know our Jesus. Amen. One more thing I want to cover in Isaiah 55:11. This is God speaking about himself. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things I send it. Now, what's key about anything with Christianity, we need to know that. What he says will happen. Now, when he said, let there be light, there was light, and things got created, and it had nothing to do with us, nothing to do with our faith. It doesn't change anything because you may not believe that. You just believe things happen, the Big Bang happened. That doesn't change the fact of God spoke and it was created. And at some point, I've used this analogy, he's created gravity. Now, gravity is so important, it doesn't have anything to do with what you believe. Gravity's there whether you believe it or not. But you know not everything in life is that way. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world, but we have a say in it, don't we? whether or not that truth connects to us. They, even though that price is paid, like I said, it's there for us, but we can go to hell because we didn't receive something, didn't believe something. So do you see there's a, there's a difference between things that God created and did, and that's the way it is. A lot of that has to do with the earth, the universe, how things happen in the spirit. That's how it is. But now our job is we're here on this earth. We've been translated to a different kingdom. What are we going to do within that kingdom? And that becomes important into our life and into other people's lives, in the ministry itself. Last thing, Psalms uh, 89, it says, My covenant I will not break nor alter the words that have gone out of my lips. Not only what he says is going to happen, but he's not going to change what he said. So his covenant with us, whether it's healing, finances, whatever that is, he's not going to alter that. So he's still the God that heals us. He's still the God that watches over us. Now, when Jesus came, he didn't do away with the Old Testament. Those promises are still yes and amen because he fulfilled it. He didn't take that away. That's for, our, that, that's for us to really equip us to do the Great Commission. Okay, now I'm going to pick back up in Matthew 13. Now, I left off before. This is the, uh, the seed being sown on the footpath, the rocky soil, the thorns, and the good soil. And they, he told this parable to them, and, the, and his uh, disciples brought him aside. And we're going to start at verse 9, 13, 9. Here's Jesus saying this, Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. If his words are Zoe, we should listen and understand. If Jesus came in here and said, hey, you need to listen and understand that. And if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, wouldn't that be true today? So we should listen and understand. Verse 10, his disciples came and asked him, why do you use parables when you talk to the people? He replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. So we're going to get firsthand information on what this thing meant. And he's saying, you need to understand this, and this is kind of a secret. You need to listen to this. You need to listen to this. Verse 12, now this is where it gets rough. I'll give this warning again. Need a hard hat, steel toe shoes, because maybe a thick wallet or a book in your pocket. You know, you get sent to the principal. If you're smart, you try to stick a book back there so they hit that instead of your behind. 
God loves you, but sometimes, we, you know, we're little children. We're not his little grown-ups. So we need to learn. Okay, with all that said, here we go. Verse 12. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even the little understanding that they have will be taken away. Well, guess who's taking that away? That's the stealer, the thief. He doesn't want you to know this. That right there should make you excited to want to know it. If the devil's trying to steal it away from me, and he only comes to steal, kill, and destroy, then I want to know about how to stop him. If he's coming to try to steal this, there must be some value there, or he wouldn't waste his time on it. Okay, here he's going to start telling us. This is why I use these parables, for they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really listen or understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, when you hear what they say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they have closed their eyes so their eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. This is where I left off before. This is where you can really get spanked right here. Is that verse up there? And they cannot turn to me and cannot, hear, cannot heal them. That's verse 15. What's God's will to do? To heal. to heal. And he says they aren't letting him. Okay, again, this is simple. What God, what's God want to do? Heal, heal right? That's clear. That's easy. A child can understand. He, he's good. He wants to heal. Who's not letting him? This is where it's kind of bend over and get spanked. He wants to heal. So there's, there's something that we need to do to take part in this to get healed. Now, if you look at this word healing, it doesn't just mean physical healing. This, if you look at this and in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, it actually mentions all kind of healing, whether it's emotional healing. Anything that curses come on you that's been stolen from you, this healing is for healing for maybe you have pains of your past. Maybe you have financial troubles. Maybe you have a trouble in your marriage, relationship with your kids. Whatever needs healing, whatever's been stolen from you, his desire is to heal. Not just physical. It includes physical healing, but it's all healing. Everything that the devil could have stolen from you or kill, steal, and destroy... His desire is to heal, but he's saying, but you're not letting me. Well, there's good and bad news with this. It's sad that we're not letting him, but the good news is, what's God's will? Is to heal. It's easy to forget that when the trouble comes. But what God says, will it happen? What he says is true. It's life. It's Zoe. But we have a decision to make. And he talked about our ears and our eyes. He doesn't control our ears and our eyes. We get to control the ears and the eyes. So there's something we can do about it. We can pray, Lord, help me to hear. Help me to see. If, if I got religion in the way, whatever it is, clear it out of me. Because I want life. I want life. Okay, well, let's keep going on. Verse 16. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but they did not see it. And they long to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. Now listen to the explanation of the parable about the, the farmer planting seeds. So now he's going to describe to us this, whether we have our eyes open and our ears open. Here's these different fields, and this fields are us. Verse 19. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. Notice Satan wants to get the seed away from you. There's something that comes, but you, you just don't understand it. You see that word footpath? The seed that fell on the footpath, that word is, is the word hadas. That hadas, that word means a traveled way or road, 
a course of conduct, a manner of thinking, feeling, and deciding. So that footpath is kind of the footpath of the world. The way you think, the things you do, que sera, sera. The way the world thinks is that footpath. And what happens if seed hits that footpath? The birds come and take it away. See, the word's going to come to you right now. I could be up here preaching and stuff, but, you know, that seed could be taken away even though Jesus said, listen to this, listen to this, listen to this. I want to heal you, but you're not letting me. Listen to this. But, if it, but what I'm saying, if it comes contrary to your belief system and how the world thinks, it's going to be gone. Good seed. Seed of the Father is going to be gone. That could sound like, ouch, I'm getting spanked here. But don't, do you, want a, do you want fruit or don't you want fruit? I mean, that's how it comes down to it. Do you really believe this Jesus stuff is real? If it's real, and it's real that life is given to me, and I could be healed, I want that. You know, there comes a point in my life, it, when I did that, as I got older, I started noticing that really I kind of wanted God to give me things because those things I trusted in. One of them was money. Another one was love. I didn't think he really loved me personally, so I needed to get that love from other people. And sad to say, when you try to suck it out of somebody else, that don't work. Ask Tricia. <laughs> didn't work. The problem is you can wreck relationships like that because they're not equipped to be God. Nobody loves you like God. As much as you love your spouse, aren't you glad they're not God? Because <laughs> you've probably had it where they've had enough of it, right? <laughs> Joe talks about it all the time. But then butters it up and saying how great she is. Because <laughs> he knows he, he's got to do it. Well, we're all that way, so I can't. I'll pick, I'll pick on Joe. He's right there because he picks out himself, but... All of us do that. I mean, we're not perfect by any means, and I'm certainly not. Okay, now, as an example, yes. The footpath is the word hadas, and it means a traveled way or road, a course of conduct, a manner or way of thinking and deciding. So it's really your thought process. What's in your head is going to determine if that's a footpath. If it thinks like the world, even though Zoe life came to you, he hit that and it just bounced off your head. I'm not even going to listen to it because it is so outrageous. I just, I don't know about that. I'm not going to listen to it. I just figure it's not important. But if it's in the Word of God, it's important, isn't it? Okay, now let's look at Mark, example of this. At Mark chapter 6, starting at verse 1. Then he, Jesus, went from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this that was given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? So can you imagine this? Here's Jesus coming to his own hometown. He's speaking these words of life to him, and they're just scratching their head like, who is this guy to be saying this stuff? Can you, would you think that if Jesus came here and started talking? Man, we'd be like, talk to me. But these people, were, their way of thinking was so much, they were so caught up in this pathway of how the world thinks. They thought, this is just a local home guy here. What? You know, I mean, I saw him running around in diapers, and he's, and he's going around healing everybody. Now, notice he said there, what mighty works are performed by him. So they're not even denying that miracles are taking place. But their way of thinking, even though they heard the miracles, they aren't denying it, but their way of thinking is so set on, who is this guy? Who does he think he is? You know, I, he grew up with us. I, I know him. His, his sisters are here and so forth. That, that's what he says in verse 3. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. Can you imagine being offended at Jesus? Have we ever been offended in Jesus and what he said? Get ready, more spanking again. This gets pretty rough. But the good news is, 
if you find out the truth, there's correction can come, right? If you've been playing in the freeway when you're a little kid and your parents finally had to spank you over it, praise God so I don't get run over by a truck, right? That's good. So God loves us. He knows how to spank us slightly and move us along. Verse 4, But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Is this his house? Watch this. This is probably going to be the roughest of the night right here. Now he could do no mighty works there, except that he lay his hand on a few sick folk and heal them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. <laughs> okay, get ready. This includes me too, because this makes me hungry. We have healings here. Do a few sick folk get healed? Yeah, a few sick folk get healed, but could it be more? Jesus said something outrageous in John chapter 14. He said, these works and greater works will you do in my name as I go before the Father. Are we doing the greater works yet? <laughs> There's ways to go. Somehow we're covering our eyes and our ears, whether we think we're the most spiritual people in the world. You know, Jesus said that the most humble, and he brought a little child and said, you need to be like this. And we're still little children. Now, this doesn't mean to beat us up. This means, hey, we got to wake up. There's more out there. The good news is God wants to heal no matter what it is. And it's there. That's good news. Now, you, the devil can look at it and say, oh, well, you're in this shape because you're an idiot. You're a rockhead. You know, and the seed, Satan just keeps stealing your seed, and it's all your fault. Well, no. Remember, the only reason he come is to lie to you and to steal from you. So don't let him condemn you either. But you can look and go, no matter how much you've screwed up your life, there's still Zoe there to go after. And we can all, I mean, this affects everybody. I have not seen anybody greater than Jesus Christ yet in my life. I've heard some stories. If you look at Peter, he did. You could replace the word, uh, the name Peter with Jesus, and he did things that you would think that was Jesus Christ in the book of Acts. But have we done that, and has it been sustained? Well, then that means there's things that we need to know more about this kingdom, don't we? There's things that we need to know, not just for us, because this isn't just about us getting our personal healing. This is about ministry. Because when uh, Peter and John were just going to a prayer meeting, they raised somebody up, and 5,000 people got saved. Shouldn't that be in our heart to want 5,000? Can you imagine 5,000 people get saved because you got up and said something? Or just because you healed somebody? Wouldn't that be great? How fast would the church grow then? I mean, isn't that what we're wanting to do? We, we try to think of clever ways to get people saved and how to, people to feel comfortable in church and to come in. You know, we don't want to get too excited. We don't want to be this and that. We pick out colors and, and websites and all. Music has to be just right. But what about if we just had some kind of a miracle take place? That's real. We should be hungry for that. that. That's not just us wanting a crazy time in here so we can hoot and holler. We're talking about people getting bored again. There's nothing more exciting than that. It's great when you get healed. It's great when you get your finances taken care of. But when somebody gets saved and you know you did that, oh, man, that just makes you want to do it more, doesn't it? That actually makes you more determined. I want to be healthy so I got, go out and preach the gospel. I want more money and finances so I can get out there and preach this gospel and fund it. Shouldn't it? I mean, that should be the driving force, that this isn't just about us name, name it and uh, blab it and grab it and name it and claim it. This is about claiming souls for Jesus Christ. I mean, they could try to put derogatory names on us, but we're pushing in because Jesus said, spank, spank. I want you, just a few sick folk get healed. His desire is bigger than that because he wants people saved. He loves you, but if he really wanted you completely whole and whatever, he could just take you to heaven right now. But why isn't he doing that? There's more people to get saved. Do you know you got saved because somebody said something or somebody uh, funded the gospel? You'd be heading for hell right now if somebody hadn't have done something. Well, there's a whole, it must be, you know, it's easy to look at and say, I just want God to take me home. We shouldn't actually be that way. We should be, Lord, keep me here as long as possible so I can keep further in your kingdom. If I, I want to live to 120 years old and I want to be rich doing it, I want to get around and not be feeble. Now, that could sound ridiculous to people. 120? 
Yeah, why not? We've been promised that. We've been promised that. We've been promised health. We've been promised. See, if that just bounces off your way of thinking, you'll just go, well, I'll probably die at 90. And guess what happens? Yeah, it, actually somebody said something. We've got such a low expectation that, man, if I make it to 90, whoo, you just skipped out 30 years of preaching the gospel. You may not preach it, but if you could be a part of the church, anything you do can, you know, I don't care if it's taking care of kids upstairs, greeting people at the door. Not everybody is the same body part. We're all different body parts, and we need to be healthy, and he wants us taken care of because he wants people saved. If he died for people so that they could become born again, isn't it make, doesn't it make sense he wants us equipped to be able to do that job? He wants us to be healthy. He, not only does he love us, he needs people to get saved. He died for this stuff. You need to be healthy. You need to have finances, not just so you can go off on a yacht and be, a, be an idiot. Because what that is is being like I was before, just give me the stuff so I can relax. At some point, I actually was honest with myself and said, what's my life goal? I want to make enough money so I can retire early and just kind of sit on the beach. And doing all that, probably Trisha would be happy about it, so I'll get more love that way. Did any of that have to do with getting anybody saved? Nope. And I may say that, it might sound like a good thing. I mean, going to the beach, being loaded with money and no cares in the world. But yet people are going to hell. I like what I heard some preacher say before. He goes, I can only go on vacation so long because at some point it's just wasted time. I could be preaching the gospel. I mean, like pastor now, he's on vacation. But he's going on for a purpose. Amen. Even vacations for a purpose. Yeah. Aren't you glad you have a pastor that really cares and not just trying to tickle your ears so more people come in so the offering goes up? Thank God for that. All too often people do that. They want people to be comfortable and come in. But, you know, what good does it do if you feed somebody food and they die and go to hell? Yeah. We should feed them too. We, we're supposed to love everybody. But to do what we need to do, we need to know about this authority. We need to do something about it. And it's not just for our selfish consumption. This is ministry we're talking about. This is people getting born again. Isn't that what church is supposed to be? Aren't we supposed to want to do that? Well, sometimes we try to come up with the craziest, clever things that just make people feel awkward and, and like they're forcing an issue. But what about if we followed what he does? How about if we just believe what he says? We take the seed he gives to us. We take it in. We prospered from that prosperity. People look at us and go, I want to be like that. I want that life. We should be, if the words are in, came to us are Zoe, our lives should be Zoe. When people look at it, we just reflect Jesus off of us and they're just drawn to us. You don't even have to go to them. They come to you and say, Tom, what is it about you? I, I just can't get my eyes off you. It's like you're glowing. Crazier things have happened in the Bible, hasn't it? I mean, we've had people where people were translated from one place to another, like beam me up Scotty physically, just to preach somebody and then get translated back. That sounds like a fairy tale. But does that show how much, doesn't that show how much God is desperate to get the word out? That he'll do something. Can you imagine if you're that individual, all of a sudden you pop up and you're someplace like, where am I? Here comes this person and you just get inside, oh, I'm going to preach to them. And then all of a sudden, boop, you're gone again. That sounds like a fairy, but is it true? Did it happen? Well, then is it far-fetched that he really wants to heal us? And that he wants us to be so healthy that we can go out and minister to others. Like we prayed for Ken. Before he had uh, some crazy stuff with him with his stomach I've never even heard of. And God healed him just like that. And he stood up here when we had the TV show, confessed before heaven and all the world about how God healed him. We don't know. Some, it's still in places that people can see it. Still on the internet. Somebody might hear that and think, you know, I need that. I need a God that loves like that. If they could do it for them, they could do it for me. You know, people get saved out of stuff like that. Okay, let's go on to the next soil. Rocky soil. This is Matthew 13, continuing on to verse 20. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receives it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long, they fall away, and as soon as the problems or persecution for believing 
God's word. Did you ever hear some word and you got excited about it? And then all of a sudden some trouble comes and really test that thing whether or not you believe it. I mean, those has happened to everybody. And sad to say, I got too many things where I let that thing bother me and, and good results didn't come out of it. Now remember, this is the same seed. One seed, the very same seed was thrown on the way of the world's thinking and the devil came and picked it off and took it away. Didn't even consider it. So there goes their blessing. Satan stole it. Here's one with rocky soil. Here's an example of this now in Matthew 14, 25. And this one, a lot of us are right here. I've just about lived in this spot. Okay, Matthew 14. Now in the fourth watch of the night, when, the, when Jesus went to them walking on the sea, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out with fear. You know, these people, half of them on there were fishermen. And they've never seen people walk out on the, you know, some figure walking out in the water. They probably think it's the Grim Reaper coming for them. Because they're out there struggling. They're probably thinking, that's it. I'm going into the briny deep here. <laughs> so they're afraid. It's like, oh, man, we're battling this storm. And now, all of a sudden, the ghosts are coming for us. Verse 27, but immediately Jesus spoke to them and saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answering him said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out in the water with you. See, there's Peter. He heard it. He heard the word with joy. It's like, yeah, that's Jesus. He went from fear to all of a sudden getting excited. Oh, this is Jesus. He's here. Now we're saved. And he's, and he's so excited. He says, ask me to come out there. Yeah, verse 28, and Peter answered and said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out on the water. So you can see he's excited. He's so excited. First he thinks the ghost is coming to him to take him away and kill him. And now all of a sudden he's like, Jesus, that's you. Call me out on the water. So he received that with joy. Can you see that? He's happy about the situation. He thought he's going to die, and now here comes Jesus. Verse 29, so he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. He's walking on the water. He's a fisherman. He knows you can't walk on the water. <laughs> you got to say, the guy's pretty bold, isn't he? Yeah. But you're going to see here, it takes more than just boldness. You got to have some roots. You received it with joy. <coughs> Shout hallelujah in church. But then, do you notice trouble doesn't happen like in church? <laughs> you notice that? You usually don't get the bad news in here. It's when you go home. And how often are you home as compared to here? So that's when the bad times come. Verse 30. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous. Well, the wind had been boisterous, right? It didn't stop yet. When he saw Jesus coming, it was boisterous at that time. That's why he thought he's going to die. Then he sees Jesus. He's excited. Call me out there. It's still boisterous. But once he gets out there, all of a sudden he looks back at the boisterous again. Remember he thought he was going to die? He received it with joy, but now he starts looking at something again. It's like he quickly forgot about his joy. It says, he was afraid and began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. Well, first Jesus just said, fear not, pretty much, fear not, I'm going to save you. And now he's saying, Lord, save me. How did he get to that point? Because he didn't have roots. Well, as soon as he saw that pressure come on, all of a sudden he's looking going, this isn't reasonable to be walking out in the water. I mean, would you feel that if you're walking on water, wouldn't the thought, I don't care if it's boisterous or calm water, aren't you going to think, oh, my Lord, how am I doing this? This isn't right. This isn't possible. You see, this comes back to that first soil. It's coming against a way of thinking. It's coming against the normal worldly thinking. You can't walk on water. You can't walk on water, but I'm walking on water. I was excited, so I start walking on water, but I'm kind of going back to that other that other ground, that path again, where I'm thinking like the world going, wait a minute, these wind and waves are going on. I can't be walking on this water. And what happened? Now, remember, Jesus' words are Zoe, they're life. And what God says will happen. But did you notice there's a difference here between gravity and whether he's walking on water? Gravity is there whether you believe it or not. Him walking on this water was his choice. Do you see the difference here? Because if whatever he said happens, he would have never sank no matter how he felt. Now, gravity, no matter what you think, is going to work.
But when it comes to your life and your choice, God says something to you, you have to pick up that mantle and take it. You have to take it. That's your test. When God says something, are you going to believe it? His words are Zoe. And a lot of times, he's, if you notice, when God tells you things, they completely go against what the world says. That's why it's trouble for us, because we're used to what the world says. Remember that kingdom we were transferred out of Satan's? We're well versed in that world. And it's so easy to go back to it, but we got to remember, wait a minute, I'm part of a different kingdom. There's a whole different operation going on here. Jesus Christ is in control of this situation. So if he says, come out here and walk on the water, I can come out here and walk on the water. Now, actually, if you notice, Jesus does save him. He does cry out, so God can help you in that. But it's best not to sink. It's best to go into this knowing the devil's going to come after me. He's going to try to bring the storm. This, this shouldn't be a surprise to me because this is how the world operates. I'm still in this world. So I shouldn't be surprised when pressure comes up against me. It's better not to... I like miracles. I'd rather just walk on the water and then come back into the boat rather than getting into a desperate situation. You know what I mean? It's almost like you should have waited until you got your faith up a little bit to make sure than just be... Example, sometimes a part of humbling yourself, you need to know where you're at. If all of a sudden Joe comes up here and he's talking about giving and how God gives back to you, if I just get all excited because Joe said that, so I take every bit of my money and just throw it in the offering, and then the first bill comes and I'm like, oh my Lord, what did I just do? I should have been honest about, is my faith there or am I just getting excited? There's a difference between faith and you really believing on it. You just got excited and your roots aren't really deep. It's just a bunch of emotion. Emotion in itself is not going to carry you because emotions are fleeting. You notice that? You wake up one day and the day before you're happy, now you're grumpy for some reason. Feelings change. The things of God has nothing to do with feelings. It's what he said will happen no matter what you feel if you grab onto it. And then what's sad with this was, and immediately when Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him, he said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? He's almost chewing out Peter for walking on the water. And he said, you doubted. Well, who here would walk out on the water, you know? So it, this was a loving thing that Jesus said to Peter. He said, Peter, you could have kept going if you didn't doubt. I mean, that was the message. He's saying the reason why he sank wasn't the wind and the waves. He said you had little faith. But the good news of that is we could do something about that, can't we? Faith comes by hearing the word. And that's why we need to hear it and hear it and hear it. And if we notice at the beginning of this, he said um, that if you aren't careful when you hear the word, what little knowledge you have can disappear because you just let it drift away. This stuff we need to hear and hear and hear and hear and hear until it becomes a reality to us. Because the, the world is saying all the time that you can't. And if you stay out of the Word and you're not in church like you ought to be and reading the Word, you're going to act just like in the world. So what's that mean for us if he said we won't let him heal him? What if, if we've been translated into this thing, other kingdom, think about yourself, how well are you operating in that kingdom? I don't mean... I know that sounds pretty rough, but there's something we could do about it. If we're on the winning team, don't you want to win? Yeah. I'm not going to be sad about that I, that I missed a few shots. I just find out, hey, we can win this thing, so let's, let's go for it and win it then. That's how we should be. Don't let the devil beat you up and say, oh, well, condemnation, you should have been a better Christian. No, we're the winners. That's good news. The good news is we don't have to lose anymore. We may have lost all up to this point, but now we're going to win from here on through. If we really believe. And you know like the man that had the son that was having these convulsions? And he brought him to his disciples. They prayed and nothing happened. And then he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus prayed over him. While the, guys, while the kid's having convulsions right there. So, I mean, can you imagine the situation that's in? Your disciples prayed, nothing happened. Bring it to Jesus. Right before Jesus, his kid's having convulsions. And Jesus says to him, If you believe, all things are possible to him that believe. That's kind of hard to believe when your kid, all you know is this kid doing this, and I bring him to the disciples, doesn't have him. I bring him to Jesus, and he's acting up right in front of Jesus. 
But notice what the man said. He says, Lord, I believe, help in my unbelief. We need to be humbled to see that we're at that place sometimes in our lives. You know, God knows what you believe and don't believe. He's not shocked by it. He's not even mad at you about it, but he is anxious to want you to humble yourself and say, yeah, show me more. Show me more of your word. Any place that's in a footpath, Lord, help me to see that, that that seed is hitting the worldly thinking and bouncing off. Teach me, Lord. I'm willing to throw away any kind of religious thought, any kind of worldly thought. Please expose it to me because I want to be good ground. Let's read the next one. Matthew 13, 22. This is the thorns. Starting at verse 22, the seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of life and the lure of wealth. So no fruit was produced. The lure of wealth is saying that I don't really need God if I just get more money. And don't in some ways we all kind of think that? Life is better having money. It does because, I mean, we grew up that way. You get food because you got money and you buy food. You need a car, you got money, you can buy a car. Even if you get sick, you can go to the doctor because you got money and you can do that. The problem is you can get so caught up in that. That's the world's way of thinking that you think that's the only way I'm going to be happy. You know, God, God has to give me that money to be able to buy the food. Well, he could make manna if he wanted. I mean, couldn't he? He did before. That comes down to, is this real or not real? Was manna really given to the children of Israel? If push comes to shove... He can he could do all kinds of things in our lives that we can't even imagine. But here's the good news. Verse 23. The seed that fell on the good soil represents those who truly hear and understand. What's the good soil? What do you got to do? Truly hear and understand. Now we could do something about the hearing part, right? We can listen. If God wants to say something, we get our listeners up. And if we aren't listening, God, grab me by the ears if you have to and, like, listen, right? We could do that. Now, notice this. This is the same exact seed, the same seed that fell among thorns that was on the footpath, stony ground. The seed that fell on good ground, so those who hear and understand, and God's word produces a harvest 30, 60, and even 100 times that much that was planted. That word understand there, Truly hear and understand. That word is synonymy. It means to bring together in the mind, to, to set together in a hostile sense as a combatant. That means when you hear that word, you grab onto it and don't let go. Like, like, it, like it's a combatant. I'm going to take that thing and seize it. That's God's word. I'm going to seize that thing. It says to make yourself think in the right way. So when you get those words of Zoe and they're coming to you, you may not understand it, but I'm going to grab those things. You know, there's a lot of things in the word you can read and it just seems impossible. But he's saying to be good soil, you've got to grab that stuff and not let go of it. Because what happens if you don't let go of it? It's going to produce. You've got, you've, we're the soil. We get to decide what kind of soil we are. And if you know anything about planting gardens that even though you can make the soil real good, plant it, and they're starting to grow, but you notice what also grows in there too? Mm -hmm. Weeds and stuff can grow in there too. So it's not like, I just need to hear this message once and I'm okay. My ground is good. Because you need to nurture that thing. You need to make sure it's watered. You need to water it with a word, even though you believe it. You need to keep, keep hitting that word, keep hitting that word grab and seize onto it, and if anything comes against what the Bible says, it says like a combatant. I grab on that word and say, I don't care what I see. I don't care about the wind and the waves. I'm going to grab onto what the Lord said, and what's the Lord say is going to get produced. 30, 60, and 100 fold. Now this is our Lord Master that said this. Jesus Christ said this, and this is the secret. Now it's up to us what we do with that seed that's planted. Is this Basilia thing real? Does he really want to heal us? And, and do we have a say in it? Now that, you can let that condemn you or you can let that encourage you. 
With me, I had so much stuff stolen from me, I started getting to a point saying, this stuff is real or it's not. I choose that it's real. And I wouldn't let go of it. I didn't care how bad things looked, feel like a failure, failure at everything you did. But if you grab onto that and that's true and you're the winner already, should I sit there and be depressed because things went bad? You know, if nothing else, just the fact that you're going to go to heaven forever, isn't that a good outcome? I don't care what kind of hell you go through here. We're the winners already. But what we need to do is get other winners in here. Other people need to hear this. We need to get other people saved. Sadly, all too sadly, churches are getting to be just people coming together to have their ears tickled and not want to offend people. It's too sad that it's that way. But what's really sad is if Jesus Christ paid for that sin, for people to be born again and they don't hear the good news. We need to combat this stuff that we're hearing in the news. We need to combat, I don't care who's the president. I don't care who the governor is. I don't care the economy. You could be looking at it, you watch the news too much and go, oh boy, there's inflation going on. You know, like I pass by the gas stations right next to my house. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. My gas just went up 10 cents more a gallon. Now I could be there and just that ruined my whole day because over 10 cents a gallon. When God's the supplier of all my needs according to his riches and glory. Do you think God can't pay that 10 cents a gallon? <laughs> but yet the way of our world is, man, if that cost me 10 cents, that's 10 cents I don't have. And you got to watch it because what that's showing is you have more trust in that 10 cents. So much that if it, that 10 cents is taken away, it ruins my whole day. Yet you're saved and going to heaven. You've got kingdom inside of your heart. And we're worried about 10 cents a gallon. <laughs> we need to be spanked, don't we? Yep. We really need spanking. That's where we need to humble ourselves. This isn't to put it down. This is to say, hey, if I'm the winner, I'm going to win. Amen. Don't you get tired of losing? Amen. If you don't get tired of losing, just keep losing a while and you'll get there. <laughs> because it'll just come. It'll come. Satan's going to keep trying to steal. He's going to keep trying to destroy and he's not satisfied until, like that word destroy meant, to unlasten and unloosen so your whole life becomes just falling apart, hopelessly, just fell into place. Just for that alone should make you excited that just to ruin his day, I'm going to wake up in the morning and I want him scared about me. What's he going to do today? Because he's got kingdom inside of him. Somebody might get saved today, and now that means the kingdom's spreading. You remember how much... Uh, the devil wanted to kill Jesus because he saw, it's like, this is the Messiah coming. This is the, the kingdom of God hitting the earth in this one person. So it's like, he was so focused, even though Jesus said, there's something, up, there's something going up here, I'm going to raise him the third day. It's like, Satan didn't even care, I need to get rid of this guy. He kills him, and now all of a sudden, he takes all of our sins, this is the big mystery, he took our sins... So then if we accept that free gift, we become kingdom distributors. And now not only does he have one person to deal with, Jesus Christ, now Jesus is everywhere. He's everywhere and the kingdom is spreading. The kingdom is spreading everywhere, but that kingdom needs to spread through us. We can't let more generations go because there's more people alive now than it's ever been on the planet. That means there's more people going to hell than ever before on the planet. And if we really want Jesus to come, he must really, God the Father must really have a number of kids that he wants and it's not there yet. And who am I to say, you know, I just want to check out because I'm tired of it. God come now, I don't care if you don't get all the kids you want, let's end this thing. That's selfish. He died for us. And that doesn't mean you have to stand up here and be a big preacher or anything, just you being in church, being faithful, letting God use you and the gifts he put within you. This doesn't mean everybody becomes a preacher. This doesn't mean if you come here, everybody's going to have to go knock on the door and get, you know, do something that's very uncomfortable. You know, this before for me would have been very uncomfortable, but it's not now. God's called everybody to do something. At first, it might seem uncomfortable, but it'll become very natural. And it'll become very natural that even the fear of that will go away. And the more you do it, the more excited you get, and the more like, I got to do this. I got, I got to go be friendly with that person. I got to go encourage them. I got to greet them at the door. I've got to get on that soundboard and do the sound. I've got to get behind that camera and do the camera because people need this. People need, and, and if I just stand up here saying, woe is me and, 
uh, gloom, despair, and agony on me. Who's going to want to? Who's going to want to hear that? Are you going to be excited to get that out on the camera and greet people? To you, just never know. With God, you just never know. He's trying to, you know, punch you in the gut to see if you'll take it. If he's not that way, you don't do that to your own kids. But how are people going to know except through us? And that means that we might have to step out in things we're not comfortable with, which means we don't go under our own strength. We go under the authority of Jesus Christ. So we need to know that authority, not just to save our own hide, but to save everybody else's hide who's going to hell. I think that's one thing that we need to move beyond. We're finding out God wants to bless us, wants to heal us, but we need to get to that next stage that we need to take that and get people born again. Because in some ways, the church can lose that. It's great to be excited in the first, but you know, God didn't set us here just to learn us, just to teach us how to be healed, or just to teach us how to get our finances taken care of, or even how to necessarily treat you know, common sense to treat your spouse right. We need that thing so that we can operate. Like, when you're married, you need that spouse to help you to be everything that you can be for Jesus Christ. And the more you love God, the better spouse you're going to be. It's true. If you put all that pressure on your spouse, they got to be this and this and that for me, that ain't going to work. And actually, the best thing you could do to your spouse is to get closer to Jesus Christ. Once you do that, then you, you know, then you can have some endurance. And believe it or not, there's people out there world we need some endurance with. Because not everybody's lovely. <laughs> and if you haven't noticed, they make fun of us and actually say we're hateful people. Yeah. Well, we've got to change that. We've got to be seen as the most loving, happy people. And you can't do that with gloom, despair, and agony on me. We need to have a real reason to be happy. That we're blessed. We've got the greater one living inside of us. And there's nothing we can't do. If he calls us to it, if he calls us to walk on the water, as ridiculous as that is, we can walk on the water if we don't look away from what he said. And there's a lot of things he's saying in here, but there's also a lot of things specifically he's talking to people's hearts. If we don't really believe this, then how are we going to believe when he tells us personally to walk on the water and do it? We need to get this down. We need to know who we are in Christ. Not just to move mountains and stuff and to be all excited, but to do what he wants to do, to be just like Jesus Christ. Amen.